and here we go. All right. So, um, hi, I'm Arlen Walker, and I'm joined by Jason Hobbs, podcaster extraordinaire, all-around cool dude. He's uh, been kind enough to join me for a game system that he knows basically nothing about um, and is not in his normal wheelhouse of games and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's really cool. And so we're going to see if Hobbs decides that he thinks it's pretty cool by the end of this. Um, so for those of you uh, who, who don't know, in I think it was it's either 2001 or 2002, and the book is way over there, so I'm not going to go stand up and grab it. But there was a, an indie RPG called The Riddle of Steel. And The Riddle of Steel was designed to um, more realistically, um, and also in kind of interesting game terms, simulate uh, hand-to-hand muscle-powered combat in a medieval world. Um, and then there was some other stuff about it that was really cool. Um, there was a really interesting um, beliefs system, basically, where when your character... It was a dice pool game, but when your character was doing something that they cared about, they had a number that represented the strength of their belief, and that could add to the dice pool. Um, so the idea being that you could kind of dig down deep and make what you care about happen and all that sort of stuff. And there's some other kind of interesting mechanical stuff. The Riddle of Steel itself as a game has some um, quirks, but it had a, a large enough following to have not one and not two, but three different um, games that have been or are in the process of being designed that are... Um, essentially retro clones of an indie game from 2001. Um, so there's Blade of the Iron Throne, which we're not playing, Song of Swords, which we are playing, and Sword and Scoundrel, which is still in open beta. Um, all of them are cool games, and all of them are built around um, a number of the things that made Riddle of Steel really cool. So what we need to do... Well, let me tell you a little bit about this system, Song of Swords. So Song of Swords, the way it works is it's dice pools of D10s with target numbers. The target number is generally a 7, but sometimes it is set by something other than um, the default, basically. So this is used, for instance, to represent with weapons that certain weapons are uh, better balanced and so are easier to parry with and things like that. So... For instance, uh, stabbing an enemy might be target number seven, whereas parrying is target number six, which means that your dice pool changes a little bit. But generally, it's D10's target number seven. Everything that you do outside of combat is built of a pool, and the pool is generally based on one of your attributes, either one of your... You have eight core attributes and then a series of derived attributes. Um and then you have skills and so you get a pool based on the number of the level of your skill and the level of your attribute you roll all of those d10s versus target number seven and you get a certain number of successes pretty straightforward concept it gets more complicated in combat which is sort of where the game i think really shines um, but we're going to go through character creation and sort of talk about all the different steps so, um, I have a whole bunch of charts up, as you can see in uh, Roll20. And these are all used at different points in character creation. So, the first thing we're going to do, you're going to have 23 PCP, which is this, this chart here, which uh, is dedicated to the kind of starting power level of the characters. And I've done some experimenting. And by experimenting, I mean I've created a couple of characters, and it seems like 23 points is about the level of a sort of sword and sorcery, young Conan, John Carter of Mars, capable character who is not kind of completely invulnerable, but who is definitely kind of head and shoulders above the average. Um, so the first thing that you're going to spend PCP on, you're going to spend one point to be a human. Because humans are race tier one. Uh, 
All right, typed in human. All right. Hobbs is player yes. name and race human. Excellent. <laughs> um, in the full Song of Swords game in there, they have a, a pretty elaborate setting that has some interesting kind of special races, basically like special versions of elves and dwarves and all of that. They're, they're kind of particular fantasy world. I think it's called Vasca. Um, but we are playing in a, a setting of my own creation that is a sort of sword and planet setting. It's uh, <coughs> very Barsoomian. There's uh, red-skinned kind of civilized peoples who live in city-states, and then there's green-skinned ones who live out in kind of a nomadic lifestyle. And uh, they're... You can, I mean, you can tell where that comes from within the, the sort of John Carter... Hobbs, did you read any of Edgar Rice Burroughs' John yes. Carter stories? Yes. Yeah, so you, so you can tell where that comes from. Yeah, I saw the movie, I've read it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm familiar with John yeah. Carter. Yeah, so, anyway. Um, so, the next thing we need to do is... Basically, for attribute points, skill points, schools and proficiency, social class and wealth, and boons and banes, you need to decide on your level of investment. And these are the ones that are all across the top of this table, 2-2 PCP investment. And it's, right, the table is fairly straightforward, easy enough to read. You invest a certain amount of PCP into each thing, and it has a certain cost. So you can't buy everything, but you can buy some of different things. Oh, okay. The PCP is on the left. so Yeah, I PCP see. is on the left. So, for instance, if you want 31 attribute points, which is um, 31 points to divide among your eight core attributes, and then there are a series of derived attributes, which are important too, you're going to spend five points to do that. So what I would suggest doing, let me do a little bit of math to make sure I remember exactly how I did it, but 31 attribute points is five PCP, five boons and banes points is five, and that leaves 12 to get level, yeah, level five, five and two. So what I'm suggesting... Um, wealth tier and... What's the other one? Say again? I was... Because you said five, five, and two. Are these ability attribute points, or are you talking about still on this investments page? So, so what I'm suggesting is that you basically invest five PCP into everything except magic, which doesn't have a cost because the magic book isn't out yet, and the social class and wealth tier, where I'm going to suggest that you start as a peasant with five Perfect. gold pieces. All right, this is almost perfect of what I was using. I'm going to drop to an old standby of a character, and I already have a concept for that. So Excellent. That, that'll Excellent. work fine. Well, and this is – so the big the thing that you would spend money on in a normal game is stuff like plate armor and things like that, and that doesn't really fit the Barsoomian <laughs> feel, right? It's, you know, Conan-style, bare-chested, swinging from – I mean, I'd be even willing to go down to the Slave Exile – and you know, get something else on here, one higher. Well, most most melee weapons cost at least a gold piece, so oh, you might okay. want to. Maybe I'm just good fist fight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you could be a fist fighter, um, but yes. So 31 attribute points, 18 skill points, 12 school and proficiency points, five boon and bane points. Should and I be writing five these gold down? Pieces is probably what you want. Should I be writing these down? Uh, yeah, you can write these down. Um, we're going to go through step by step and assign the values for all of these 18 skill uh 12 proficiency it's interesting that there's two different things skill and proficiency yeah so skills are your out of combat skills schools and proficiency points are where you learned to fight and how well you know how to fight So really all I need to do is the five boons and banes, the 12 proficiency, the 18 skill, and the 31 attribute, everything yes, else. Yes, that's, that's precisely what I am going to suggest. That'll start your character off 
with a a good kind of adventurous build to go out and conquer in a uh dying planet all that sort of stuff i don't know about conquering geez well don't you don't you want to seize treasure and uh you know <laughs> beautiful maidens and all of that sort of stuff i don't that, know we'll see i guess that that seems appropriate to the setting to me all right you don't have yeah. to well i don't want to break out of the setting mode for sure yeah okay so um attributes there are eight core attributes strength agility endurance health will wit intelligence and perception mm. Each of these is important in their own way, um, and they are fairly self-explanatory for what they are. I mean, strength is pretty straightforward. It's your, your muscle power. What's average? Average? Human average is four in everything. Mm. So a, a, a so regular human has four in all the core eight stats. I can't quite get that because I only have three. Oh, you, no, you can because you get level one for free. Oh, okay. I see. All right. All right. All right. I see. Yeah. Right. So that means there's eight of them. So that's eight points. Okay. Yeah. So you get essentially eight points to get up to level one for free. And then it costs one to one getting okay. everything else up higher. So getting everything to four is 24 points out of your. Well, let's just start there. Yeah. That's probably a good place to start. And like I said, that's the human average right, is so. four in everything. So strength right. strength is muscle power. It's, you know, lifting things. It's also how hard you hit in combat. Um, you use half of your strength as your strength damage bonus when you successfully hit somebody in combat, and that's added to the damage that you do. Because this game, rather than using hit points, what we do is every wound has an associated wound level and the wound level is determined based on how successful you were at hitting and how hard you hit and where you hit and how well armored the person is where you hit them because the armor reduces the wound level all of that sort of stuff is factored in to create a um, essentially a simulation of what would happen if somebody hit somebody with a sword in that way in that area with that armor, all that sort of stuff. I want to be, I want to be kind of an agile, two-handed fighter. I think. Yeah. So six is good, or should I take it up to a seven? Or um, so six agility is good. Agility is also used to calculate adroitness, which is what ADR is. Okay. So adroitness is your character's. Um, it's kind of like their reflexes. It's their their mental and physical energy. It's their raw ability in uh, melee combat, basically. And it's the average of your wit and your agility. Yeah, I was thinking about increasing my wit a point. Yeah. Because uh, I like to be witty. Yeah. Or uh, I would say I want to be uh, above average perception. Three... So I have three points left over at this point, I think. Yeah, so 24, that left, 7, 2, 2. So yeah, three points left over. So let's go 5. I have two points left over. Can I bump agility straight to 7? Yeah, you can bump agility to 7. And then wit to 6. No idea what I'm doing, but I think that's all. 5, 12, and 12 is 24, 39. That looks like 39. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Nice. All right. So we've got we've got your raw stats. Um, so like I said, strength, agility, endurance is is kind of like constitution minus the like poison saving throw section, which is health. Um then so obviously willpower, wit is your kind of quick thinking versus intelligence is your slow thinking, right? Um, you know, sitting down and performing a science experiment is intelligence, but coming up with witty banter on the fly is wit, that sort of thing. Um, and then perception, pretty obvious. Adroitness, like I said, adroitness is basically your character's um, mental and physical energy 
that they have as their kind of natural ability especially in melee combat and it's also stuff like their reflexes because the idea being that your reflexes are determined not just by your physical quickness but by your mental quickness and both of those come together to define your adroitness so adroitness is the average rounding down as we round down for everything in this game of your agility and your wit so it'll be six six okay mobility is that what mob is yeah, mobility is your strength plus your agility plus your endurance divided by two, and that is equal to how many yards you can move in a round. Looks like eight. Yep. Yeah, 12, 16, so eight. Mobility. Oh boy, hold a second. I wasn't clicked in there, apparently. I'm like, why isn't this happening? All right, there we go. Nope, it's still not working. It's weird. There we go. I have to use that. This must be carrying capacity, endurance, and strength. Carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is your endurance and your strength. Yep. And not average, just the sum of your endurance oh, and your strength. Oh, okay. So that's um, not big. Carry is modeled in this game as... Um, It's it's uh, an abstraction of the the weight that you're carrying. It's not like physical pounds or anything like that. So part of the idea, one of the really cool things that I like in this game is that, for instance, wearing heavy armor on your hand and your forearm, that often has as much or more weight as the heavy armor that you would wear on like your shoulders or your back. And the idea being that, well, that's because it's getting swung around as you swing your sword around, and so it's kind of taxing on your arms in a way that the armor up on your shoulder isn't, which I think is, is pretty cool. There's yeah, sure. There's a neat kind of realism there. All right, your toughness is four, because every character's starting toughness is four, okay. unless you take a boon or a bane related to it. Okay. Oh, it didn't go in. Jeez, what's going on here? Four. Okay. All right. Your charisma is your willpower plus your wit plus your perception divided by two. So it'll be um, seven. Willpower, perception divided by two. Willpower, perception, and wit divided by two. All right. Grit. And then your grit is your willpower divided by two plus or minus any modifiers. So it'll be two. Okay. All right. So now we need to do skill points. Um, skill points, the way they work is uh, one to one basis. You buy skill levels. Um, you get your skill points from your PCP investment plus your intelligence rating in skill points. So it'll be. Um, actually 22 skill points available to put into skills these start at zero what happens if i don't have anything in them uh so technically there are some untrained skills um we start at zero if you try to you can't use a a certain skills while untrained in the main game but there's no restrictions on um buying up skills so if if, for instance, you wanted to put, like, 10 points into surgery, you could. Um, be a little silly. Surgery is your doctoring skill. Um, not that it's not very useful in this game, but you probably are better off spreading your skills around to all the different things um, that you think would be uh, pretty cool. Okay, so uh, I was definitely thinking... So He's going to have athletics, right? Because that would yeah. be like a... But I don't know what level. Is four average or one is average or what's average? Um, skill levels don't have as much of the human average, but level... I think it's level... Level four is the level that you have to have in order to teach someone to use oh, the skill. okay. Okay. All right. So uh, he's been a guy living on the streets, so... At this point, I'm going to put a three there, a three here, uh, and climbing. We should have a three. 
Um, gather. Oh, I put it on etiquette. I meant gather information, not etiquette. I don't think my guy would be an etiquette guy. Um, we'll go five and stealth, whatever that means. Nice. Three and subterfuge. Ooh, and agility. I'm definitely making a thief -y type character. So that's five, 10, 13. I think I have 16, 19, 22. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, that's uh, a great list of skills. That's you know perfect for somebody who's gonna get into trouble. Um, so the way, like I said, the way that this works is that when you are testing a skill, what we do is we take the relevant attribute plus the um, the skill level plus or minus anything for like modifiers or stuff like that. But there aren't that many in. Um, in the dice pool level and that's the number of d10s that we roll and we roll that versus uh, target number of seven and your number of successes basically determines whether or not you succeed because there are a certain number of required successes to do different things hmm. okay well, i think i should get have a little more stuff somewhere no no i think that's great oh, that uh observation, that... maybe oh. well in your character as your character grows they will have a chance to spread okay. out into more things and all that that's one of the so one of the interesting things about the way that character advancement works in this is that at the end of character creation we're going to decide on some of your character's arcs which is things like what they believe in and what they um consider to be glorious and what their kind of hamartia their fatal flaw is Ooh, um, and as you play up those things you get points that are used to improve your character Okay. All right. So now we need to go to, I'm going to switch you over to the next page, the combat page, which is the little, the boxes up at the top, right? The crossed swords is combat. Okay. So what we need to do is schools and proficiencies. So you have to decide what school it is that is where your character learned their uh, their fighting ability. And I will read out the options for you. Okay. So there is the scrapper, self-taught in the school of hard knocks. The soldier... Fighting men trained en masse to fight with battlefield weapons in gruesome and efficient manners. The officer training school. The noble training school. The traditional fencer, unorthodox fencer, and the esoteric school. I think he's definitely a scrapper. Yeah, that's kind of what it sounded like from what you were describing. So a scrapper costs no points to join. And you get four max proficiencies. So if you look at this chart down here, um, the one that I'm pinging, you will see a list of different melee proficiencies. And these are all, um, you get to choose four of them to be skilled at. Basically four ways of fighting that you know how to, to fight with. Mm. And then if you, um, for instance, if you were trained in one-handed sword, but you didn't have a sword, you had to get a one-handed blunt weapon, well, then you would default from your one-handed sword level. And so you would be at minus one to your pool. That's what this minus one means. Mm, okay. um, so it represents the idea that what you're familiar with, you're able to fight with efficiently. What you're not as familiar with, you're able less able to fight efficiently. And you also don't get advantage of your talents when you're fighting with a weapon that you're not proficient in. So there aren't really two-handed ways, right? Uh, there are. There are two-handed two blunt and two-handed sword. I mean two weapons. Two weapons. Sorry. You totally could fight with two weapons if you want. How would uh, I do that? Uh, so that would be proficiency in one-handed sword or one-handed blunt. And um, you would also want to take the ambidextrous boon. Okay. So I should just take four in one-handed sword? 
<laughs> no, you uh, you take four four different proficiencies, and then you have a level to your school that determines how well you know how to use these things. Okay. I guess I think I am I looking at the wrong one. The default matrix. Yeah, you're looking at the default matrix. Yeah. And that has the list the the list running down the left. That's all of the available melee proficiencies. So I have four points that I have to take off of this, or I can take it off of another table as well. Um. So the way that the right, so schools and proficiencies works is you have four choices to make here, and yeah. then we're going to determine the level in your school. The level in your school is what determines how good you are with these things. This this choose choice of four is your um what you know how to use. Your level in your profession in your school is how well you know how to use them. Okay. So, so let's say like if you were like pugilism, dagger, and one handed sword, and that's Yeah, should... so you could do dagger and grappling pugilism, dagger, one handed sword, you could totally do that. Okay. As your four. So that makes sense, right? Yeah. So what that what that means is that you get to use your school's full level to calculate your combat pool every time you're using those weapons. All right. So it's grappling, pugilism, uh, dagger, and one hand sword. Okay. Yes. So the next thing we need to do is calculate out what level you're going to get to, and I will do that really quickly. Um, so cost zero, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So you're going to be school level eight. How do you how do you figure that out? Uh, from this table right here. Oh. It's got the S and P or arc cost of each rank. boy so the way this works in combat is that in combat you have what's called a combat pool or cp and your combat pool is your adroitness plus your school level assuming you're using something that you're proficient in and that's the dice that you can allocate to doing things in one what they call a bout of combat a bout is essentially one back and forth okay so, for instance, if you were trying to stab somebody, what you would do is declare, okay, I'm going to do a thrust at the belly with, say, seven dice. And so you would subtract seven from your combat pool because you're allocating those dice to a thrust. He would say, well, I'm going to parry with eight dice. And then we roll the dice, and based on the results of the die rolling, we get the, uh, the effect of that kind of pair of maneuvers. Okay, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And it, it changes depending on who gets to go to, to uh, say what they're doing first, right? Each time. Yeah, yeah. So, for first. instance, if, if you thrust at him and he parries effectively enough, he will get to make an attack, his attack, and then you have to parry his attack. Otherwise, he'll, you know, slash you. Okay. All right. So... What we need, we're not going to worry about superior maneuvers right now because they kind of require more familiarity, but we are going to worry about talents. So you're going to have three different talents. I would suggest the first one is you want to have weapon primacy. Weapon primacy just gives you one extra die to your pool whenever you're using the weapon that you're most familiar with. Okay. So that's probably one of them. Another one that's really useful in the setting is Head Guard, which Head Guard gives you two free dice to add to any roll to parry or dodge an attack made at your head. Okay. And then the third that I would... Hmm? Plus one die... Uh, for with um, proficient weapons, is that what it is? Yeah, plus one die with uh, with one weapon that you're most used to using. I choose one of them. You choose you choose one specific weapon, and not one category, like not one handed swords, like a, a single rapier that you've trained with and you know how to use that one really well. Mm. 
How many different swords and daggers are there? There are a lot of swords and daggers available. Wow. As as you can imagine, this is the sort of game that attracts people who like their uh, different swords and daggers. Okay. What is a, a scrapper sword? Doesn't sound like a rapier to me. It would just probably I'm... not a rapier for uh, the character that you've described. Um, no. Although you're welcome to do that. And then I would suggest as your last talent, you take swift sword, which gives you a plus one bonus to initiative tests. Which is, you get one extra die when you are testing initiative, which is uh, really powerful in this game. Because if you steal initiative on somebody, you can basically stab them before they get a chance to react. Okay. All right. Now we need to figure out what type of weapon you are actually going to use. Um, do you have the PDF open, Hobbs? No. Okay. I don't even remember where it was. Okay. Well, that's all right. Um, what kind of weapon were you imagining? Well, what, uh, what kind of short sword do you think? Oh, it's one handed sword. So it doesn't have it necessarily have to be short. I supposed what, uh, like do we have all weapons from all different like social and cultures from earth or there, there are certainly a great many weapons from different, uh, cultures and, periods of earth um there's lots of different melee weapons represented like uh how would you picture the culture uh, that my character would be starting in would it be more roman would it be more you know egyptian what what how would how do you imagine those weapons so i imagine it more as kind of like uh that the um kind of renaissance-y almost oh, that so it's it's kind of point. later that there are a lot of the sort of like lighter like rapiers and uh cutlasses and sabers and things like that that's sort of what i imagine is being used a lot is that for the nobility or is that for you know the scumbottom vagrants that grew up on the streets uh probably both uh, it seems like you might have, if you're you're not noble, you might be more likely to have something like a kind of heavier, like a cavalry saber or something, a, a big slashing weapon or a scimitar, as opposed to having a, um, you know, a, a rapier is kind of an elegant weapon. That you so you're thinking use. more uh, musketeery in yeah. art. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess John Carter is kind of sabery anyway, but. I don't, yeah, I don't remember what sort of sword John Carter actually is in the book. Yeah, so if I am usually going to use like a, because uh, um, my originally I was thinking like some kind of punch dagger, or a cestus or something, but because uh, I was thinking more Roman for some reason, but uh, in this situation, I see no reason why. Uh, I, I couldn't have found my way to some, you know, better equipment. Now, now instead of like just <laughs> wearing wraps and a, a cloak or something, I picture, you know, in a wide brimmed hat, you know, more of in like the musketeer age or the Renaissance age, I guess. Um, so yeah, we can just do that. That's easier. We can, is it, what's a poignard? Is that what that is? Or is it still, why don't you send me that? I have that link. Why don't you send me that link again? The, uh, I think it's in the the Discord chat between us. The, oh my gosh. The Google Drive link. But I will... So it seems like... So a poignard is, is kind of a dagger. That's the other hand. That's the offhand, right? Yeah. So you could definitely have... You could definitely have a poignard in your left and then something like a... I'm wondering a rapier or like I'm looking at it kind of maybe a saber is... Or a um, hmm. Does it, would this be in the dueling? No, this would be in the Song of Swords core rulebook. Song of Swords core rulebook. Looking at page one hundred nine is daggers, one ten and one eleven is one handed swords. Oh, this isn't. Oh, I'm in the Hunter's Handbook. I went to the wrong thing here. All right. So you said, holy cow! How one one hundred nine? One hundred nine is daggers. Yeah. And then I the see. next two pages are one handed sword. I see his art.
All right, this is a 105. Interesting. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there's a, a lot of options for people to get excited about having yeah, a specific get, sort of sword that they want. My first compact, my first thoughts were like main gauche, misericord, or poignard. So main gauche is like also basket hilted. So yep, yep, main gauche is definitely a great. Um, it's even got the companion weapon tag, which let me find. I seem to remember that that is. Yes, when this weapon is used to make a defense maneuver, one devoted dice automatically succeeds before rolling. So if you parry with a main gauche, you get one automatic success from your pool. What's a small sword or a spadroon? I don't know what a spell. Oh, here, there's pictures. Um, a small sword is kind of like a, a shorter rapier almost. That's so, what I was uh, a lighter. I just like the idea of them being light and thin with fluid thrusts. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A small sword a small sword is definitely a great weapon. A small sword and a main gauche would be uh let's go with that. Good setup. Alright, so now we need to fill out the melee weapons on the uh the character sheet so that we know when we get into combat what they do. Alright, I better Excellent. Yeah, so I can see that small sword. So what these these numbers mean. So we've got type, obviously, for a small sword, S sword, hands, one-handed, reach, medium. Um, reach is, at the start of combat, determined by whoever has the longest reach. They're basically keeping the other person at bay at their reach. Um, but it can change over the course of the combat, and there's um, some interesting interactions with regard to, like, for instance, if you had a pike or something, and the mm -hmm. other guy gets in close with a, a small sword, you're in serious trouble trying to use that pike because it's not built for fighting close quarters like that. So you probably want to drop it and pull out your secondary weapon. But you're also in trouble just getting into those close quarters when someone else has a pike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're you're also definitely in trouble trying to get that close to somebody who's trying to yeah. stab at you to keep you away. Definitely. I would think so anyway. Alright, so what the numbers mean. Small sword, it's under swing six and then minus two C. That means that your target number for a swing is a six and it's minus two cutting damage. So it's not as useful for chopping through things as like a big long sword or something. It's got a light, thin blade. Mm -hmm. But the thrust, the thrust is 6 minus 0 P. So it's, uh, the piercing-wise, if you thrust with it, you don't lose any damage off of your successes. And because it's target number 6, that represents the idea that it's relatively easy and fluid to, to use. And then we have defense seven, uh, and then in parentheses three. So that means that the target number for defensive maneuvers with this weapon is a seven, and your hand has three armor if it gets hit. The, the hand yep. that is uh, encased in the, the sort of basket hilt, you can imagine, yep. gets some free armor. 15, how many gold and a silver piece? Uh, it is 20, 20 silver to one gold, and then 12 copper to one silver. What? It's the, it's the, the ancient system set about by Charlemagne. Oh boy. I wouldn't want to mess with that. I didn't know Charlemagne was on Barsoom. Well, it, it, it's the one in the book that they, for whatever reason, Charlemagne uh, set it up in Vasca too for their setting. So who knows? Um, but yeah. All right, I'm filling in the mango here. Nice. 
Yeah, same sort of thing. What is reach H? Reach H is hand. Oh, so I can only hit someone's... Oh, it's just as long as your hand, I guess. Yeah, it's basically the idea that the reach for that weapon is your arm sticking out, as opposed to with, like, a sword, it's extended past the end of your arm. All right. Companion. Light. All right. Wait. All daggers are zero, apparently. Yeah. Well, and you don't actually count... Uh... wait for weapons that are in hand um it's assumed that that the the weight of the weapon is basically it's uh encumbering degree if you've got it like on your back or in a sheath or something like that or should i why... write sorry go ahead go ahead Which is why for instance the the weights for spears are really high because the idea is you're supposed to hold that in your hand if you put it like on your back it's really Unwieldy. I concur. Finally, a game after my own heart. What um, should I put the companion blade stuff in here somewhere? Uh, yeah. The so um, you can just put under special the the name of the thing. Mm -hmm. Just put companion. Don't put in the actual notes. No, you don't need to put in. Um, okay. All right. I'm I'm just updating the man who you might end up facing. Oh, okay. Minutes once we get oh, your boy. character ready. A few minutes. Nice. Yeah, we're we're pretty close. So we've done schools and proficiency. We've done wealth. You had five gold pieces, and you spent some of them to get your small sword and your main gauche. Um. We can assume for right now that you're wearing kind of cloth clothing. If you want something heavier, then we can figure that out. Um, but this is a, a setting that is more of a kind of like, you know, light, light cloth and you parry to defend yourself instead of wearing heavy armor, that sort of thing. No pistols? Uh, I have not decided if there are firearms or not I guess we'll have to we'll have to see all right and then you have five boon and bane points to spend um, on boons so if you want to take ambidextrous like I suggested you might not actually need ambidextrous to use the main gauche effectively because it's short um, let me double check that Although ambidextrous does let you do the cool thing where you, you know, toss your your sword from your left hand to your right and say, you didn't know that I wasn't left-handed, did you? I'm not either. Yes. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let me see where does it say. Yeah, dual wielding with a dagger or other weapon with S reach or less in the offhand and another weapon in the primary hand incurs no penalty. So you don't have to be ambidextrous if you don't want to be. Okay, well, I shouldn't then. I think I should, like, get uh, some contacts. You could, yeah, contacts is good. What's this Bane stuff? Banes are, so you don't have to take any Banes because you've got five positive points. If okay. you want to take more than five points of boons, you got to take bane points to even it out. Mm. So the boons are all kind of good things. The banes are all kind of bad things. Straightforward enough. What what are these contacts? 
Contacts are uh, people that you know. Let me read from the book what it says about contacts. Contacts. You have access to a network of informants, friends of friends, cousins, or entire flocks of talkative little birds that you can call upon for information. You can use contacts to gain insight and intelligence on any subject you please. Usually this requires the expenditure of a few coins and may take anywhere from 10 minutes to a week. Roll your charisma at the TN decided by this boon, and if you meet the required successes, you gain the information you need, with bonus <laughs> successes supplying you more information. And then there's information for me on how I should set the uh, required successes. And basically each um, level of contacts reduces the target number of the charisma check. I think I would use charisma gathering information for that too, since you have some stuff in gathering information and that seems. So sweet. I'm poor. I could take a bane of poor and get the four points from that. And then I could take contacts at four. I would still have five points left over. Yeah, you could do that. This is what we're kind of doing is writing stories through this, just like any point building game, right? Yeah, yeah. We're we're coming up with the idea of kind of how all this works and what your your character's so, nature and all that. Ambidex. Oh, you said I didn't need to take that. Dang it. So the boon I took was contacts. I just put the four in the description. Yeah, you could put uh, four points. Four at four. I don't know what that means, but... Context four, you can make a note that means you're at TN six. TN six, that helped. And I took a poor four, so that'll help me motivate four me. Four at level four, let's see what that does. So you have even less wealth to start out with, but that's okay because I think the only thing you needed to buy was your sword and your main gauche, and uh, you still have enough for that. So I want to be like uh, wanted. Wanted. Hmm. It's at the bottom for five points, it says. Yeah, wanted. How, is there like a maximum number of banes that you can take? You you could take as many banes as you like. There's no there obviously if you take uh right taking banes and then not taking the boons to to balance it out, you're not getting any benefit from those banes. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're just excited for a story thing, I am. I'm taking enemies at three, wanted at five. All right, <laughs> wanted at five. You're wanted by the law. So um, off. You're wanted by the law either in your own country or others. And that you're uh, wanted alive at level five. As opposed to at level ten, you'd be wanted dead. I also took enemies at three. Enemies at three. Let's see what enemies says. Enemies for three. A single dangerous individual, a small group, or minor organization is your enemy. I think like a, a gang that I have, uh, you know, made angry in the past. I picture it kind of urban-y, is it not? Yeah, yeah, it's fairly urban. There's, um, I'm imagining, so um, you probably know, but way back when people believed that Mars was covered in like a whole canal system. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm picturing sort of like that, a kind of like canal system with city states all around. And most of the adventures will be fairly urban, although we may get into some wilderness hijinks too, if. Uh, so I will take allies. Uh huh. I don't have great allies, but allies out of one maybe, so I can, whatever that means. So right now I have what five points. 
and I have seven twelve to spend. So I've spent five. I was thinking like bloodthirsty or brave or some of these things like this, like or maybe good eyes. So I can since I didn't really take a great perception. What's natural born killer mean? Natural born killer gives you um, for each level you get a plus one bonus to your CP, your combat pool. Mm. It's your your killer instincts make you deadlier. I think I should be a natural born killer. And then allies one it means you have an ally that is a minor local power, a crime boss, a mayor, or a town sheriff are the examples. I'm wanted by the law, so that wouldn't be it. So I must have done something for a crime boss. Yeah, it seems like you're probably uh, you've got a crime boss, and then there's kind of rival gangs that are opposed to you, as well as the, the law in general. Plus, Natural Born Killer was one plus die per level, right? It's plus one CP per level of Natural Born. All right, so that's seven, eleven. So I need one more point. Um, I was thinking like maybe favor. I might be a little bit literate, which is or languages. Which do you think is best? Uh, so I'm imagining that there aren't really like a whole bunch of different regional languages or anything like that. So literate yeah. would be my suggestion between those two. Okay. Well, I said favor as well. Oh, favor. Um, hmm. Favor versus literate versus languages. Um, favor would force another NPC, probably. Yeah, favor would be uh, an NPC. You're owed it. So level one favor, you're owed a serious favor from a regular man or a trifling favor from someone of power. Uh, I like a serious, maybe. So someone I actually have helped, so I'm not... Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So we'll have a, a kind of regular Joe NPC who owes you a pretty serious favor. Yeah, saved his life, blood debt, some, something like that. All right, yeah. that's it. All right, that's it. So now, you want to do a mock combat just to, to see how it plays out? Sure. All right, let's do that. So we need calculate. Maybe I should apply the water first. Is that bad? Of course. No, that's fine. Why don't we do that? We'll we'll take a pause for a second and uh, go get some water. And... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I am back. You are back. I am back. Excellent. So, what we need to do for this... Uh, have you decided on a name for your character? Well, I was kind of wondering, how do you... What kind of... Are you thinking kind of Frenchy names, or...? Um, not necessarily. I honestly, if it's kind of like a weird-sounding fantasy name, it's probably fitting within the, the milieu. Oh, Hobbs, I think you're muted. I just muted myself. I wasn't muted, then I muted myself before I started time. How about Thorpus? Thorpus? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds great. Thorpus. All right. So, we need... What do we need to do? We need to calculate out your CP pool for a fight. So, your CP pool is your adroitness your school level assuming that you're proficient in what you're using which you are because you have one-handed swords and daggers and any miscellaneous modifiers all right so what is so your school level is eight your adroitness is six so that is 14 plus 1 to your CP pool because of your weapon primacy with the small sword and plus 1 for 
your natural born killer instincts. So that sounds to me like 16 for your CP. Nice. Yeah, so that's that's a lot. That's uh you're you're pretty dangerous. So, we can imagine perhaps this is this is maybe uh this will be kind of why you're wanted by the law is because you killed this man. Um because I I'm pretty sure you're going to succeed at killing him. Um but you can imagine <laughs> you two he he doesn't have an offhand weapon, but he also has a small sword, and you two kind of square up, maybe in an alleyway somewhere, um, opposed to each other, ready to to duel. So we don't have to worry about reach because you're both using the same weapon with the same reach. Um, what we do need to worry about is stance. So you can choose to be in aggressive cautious or defensive stance and basically what this does is it signals to your adversary what you're planning on doing if you're going aggressive then you must make an attack on the first period of the bout if you're cautious you can choose whatever you want to do and if you're defensive you um ha can't make an attack on the first period of the bout every bout is divided into two periods and your cp pool refreshes at the end of the second period so what this means is most of the time it'll be essentially one back and forth and then another back and forth so one for instance like a thrust and a parry and then they'll thrust and parry and we'll go back and forth like that and that'll be one bout is a uh, two sets of attacks well torpus is known for his speed yep. and his subterfuge so he is going to be aggressive can yes. he use his subterfuge to like faint or anything or uh he can faint we're gonna we're gonna why don't we start with so what the book suggests and i think it's a good suggestion is that you start with only four maneuvers and that's the cut the thrust the parry and the void Void is just the old fencing term for dodging. Um, so for the first opponent, um, you're going to declare aggressive. This uh, opponent uh, is going to be defensive. He's trying to protect himself for the first. He thinks he can parry you and get an opening. So now what you have to do is you have to decide what exactly you are going to try to do to him. So does he know, I, I have to say, where I'm going to thrust in all these? Or how how specific do I have to be? So if you go into the, the Rule 20 journal under the Rules Handouts folder, we've got one Rules Handout that is the Hit Location Silhouette and another one that is Target Zone's Melee. And it will be helpful to look at those. So the hit location silhouette details all of the different places that a person could get stabbed or cut on a sort of paper doll um, figure. The target zone is what... Explain these things, or do I have to say exactly where I'm trying to cut and all that, or no? So you do, you have to declare a target zone, but we don't find out exactly where you hit until um, you actually make the successful attack, assuming you make it. So the swinging target zones, there are nine swinging target zones and nine thrusting target zones. And then assuming that your attack um, gets through his defense, you will roll 1d10 and we'll find out the precise location based on your general target zone. All right, so I say I'm going to thrust to the chest. Yeah, so thrust to the chest exactly like that. So you're going to thrust to the chest, and then how many dice are you allocating to your thrust? And so I have to go through two, four different things, right? My turn, his turn, my turn, his turn, or whatever. Um, so or the actions are resolved simultaneously. So you're essentially, what you want to do is you've got one period, and then there's going to be a second period um, still in this bout before your CP refreshes. So, for well, instance, if you... you how many dice before you decide what you're doing? Um, you you have to declare as part of your declaration how many dice. 
Because that so that way that person can make a decision based. So that on way that. the the person yeah that's part of the idea the the person on defense can make a decision about how much they want to invest in terms of their mental and physical energy to try to stop you. All right. So you said I have sixteen dice, right? You have sixteen dice, and I'll mark it down on your CP pool on your character sheet. All right. I'm going to use five. I'm going to use five dice on my thrust to the chest. Great. So you're going to use five. He is going to use, and has to use a fair number of his, because unfortunately for him, the small sword has a worse target number for defense than thrusting attacks. So he's going to use six from his pool. He's going to parry your thrust with six dice. So now what we do is we roll the d10s to see who gets more successes. So slash R, for me it's 6d10 greater than 7, and for you it'll be 5d10 greater than 6. Ooh, I got my, my unnamed character got four successes with his parry, and you only got one success with your thrust. So he is easily able to knock aside your blade. Um, and he actually gets to take initiative because if he has he has enough bonus successes. So what we do, we measure level of success in bonus successes. He has enough bonus successes from parrying to steal initiative. Hobbs, you are muted again. I'm nodding. I'm eating. So oh, too, sorry. So I don't. I didn't want to be crunchy. Um. So. I'll just tell you, he only has two CP left. He doesn't have nearly as many as you do, but he is going to thrust for all he's got. He's going to thrust with two CP at your upper arm. Probably your right upper arm because you're, you know, squared off against him, and that's the closer one. All right, so my parry is a six. His thrust is a six, so we're pretty even, but I don't want to... I don't want this guy to even touch me. So you said it was two. So if I go four, then I got a pretty good chance of being successful. Yeah, you got great chances. Uh, you could parry. You could also. So one of the things you could do is you could do a sim simultaneous attack and parry. So that's sort of a more complicated maneuver. But because you have a uh, A weapon in each hand you could do what it's technically called is a guarded attack so you could declare an attack maneuver for a certain number of dice oh and... so i don't you're basically saying i'm back on like am i being aggressive or because now no we're still in the same stance as before right we're uh so stance only matters for the very opening of the combat but what i'm saying is for instance what you could do is you could try to parry his uh, blade with your offhand weapon, your main gauche, and also at the same time try to stab him. And there's nothing that he can do about getting stabbed in that case because he's used up all of his dice. And you've got a lot more dice than he does. Okay, yeah, so I'll stab him in the groin. Yeah, so you've got 11 dice. So you're going to put, what What did you say, four into parrying? Yeah. So can, you can put uh, seven, seven, into, seven into a thrust to the groin? Yeah. All right, so first we have to resolve the uh, his thrust and your parry. So he is going to thrust with two at a target number of six. So he gets two successes, you get three successes. Once again, blade battered aside. And now we resolve your thrust to the groin. That's still a six. Yeah, so 70, 10, greater than six. Three successes. Nice. So now we need to roll a 1d10 without any success check to see where you actually stabbed him. I can really see what I had put there. There's a lot of charts open on my... Ooh. Yeah, there's a lot of... There's a fair bit of charts. So you get him in the belly. You missed his, his groin itself, but you, you aimed a little high, and you get him in the belly. Mm. So 
You got three bonus successes, so that is equivalent to essentially three damage um, in in this system. The, the bonus successes count directly towards damage. Makes sense. Your small sword does uh, no modifier to damage for a thrust, so you don't get any modifier there. Your strength is five, so your strength damage bonus is two. So you're looking at an effective damage side of the calculation as five points for damage. Okay. That we subtract from that his toughness, which his toughness is a three. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, not toughness. His grit is a three. His toughness is a four. Ooh, so, his grit is a three compared to my grit of a two. Interesting. So what that means is that there is left over one net uh, damage, which means that he's going to take a level one wound to the belly. So let me go to the wound chart, and I will tell you precisely what happened. With a level one wound to the belly, a sallow stab to the side of the midriff, no real damage. He takes one stun, four pain, and three bleed. So what those mean is his one stun means he immediately loses one die from his pool, which will happen after the refresh now. His, what did I say, four pain? Yeah. Four pain. He only has three grit, so his grit reduces the pain, but the pain subtracts from the total amount refreshed. So he only had eight to his CP before. He now gets seven dice back instead of the full eight because he's in a little bit of pain because you, you just jabbed him in the belly. And then he also gets that one subtracted away from his uh, pool. So he's going to be down to six CP for this next bout. And then the bleed, we don't have to worry about until it gets to an increment of five. But it's... Uh, it is realistically dangerous to start bleeding out in a fairly medieval world, as you can imagine. So, now we do the second bout of the fight. Um, you will have initiative because you hit him last where he wasn't able to do anything. So, if you want, you can strike again. He only has six dice. And you have your full 16 again. Yeah, might as well. Yeah, so you might as well just thrust at him again. Um, he doesn't have the bonus of versus his head. Uh, maybe I'll go uh, for an upper thrust this time for the neck area. Yeah, okay. thrust towards the neck. Six, so I'll just use six dice. Six dice for a thrust to the neck. He's going to try to parry with six dice. Because he's got to do something. Otherwise, he's just going to get cut to pieces. No, no, he's going to parry with five dice, I think. That'll be more, because he's hoping that he'll get lucky and he'll get a chance to strike back at you. So, do, do, five dice less than... Oh, no. All right, so once again, we need to roll a d10 to see precisely where you hit him. That's not right. I did it less than 10 somehow. Oh. Uh, you got three successes, three. though. Three versus three. three. He only got two successes. Oh, yeah. Actually, all right. I got so that you far. get a net of one success still. So once again, you successfully uh, tag him. We need to die 10. So we need to die 10 to see where you hit him. Another eight means that you hit him in the face. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's you keep scary. aiming high when you're stabbing at him. I wonder if you're... Maybe you're taller than him or something. <laughs> but you hit him in the face. And your strength damage bonus is a 2. So that means that's only 3 subtracted from his toughness. So he's going to take a level 0 wound. So basically just a little small cut to the face. Um, but that's going to do 1 pain... So he's going to get even less dice back the next bout. And once again, you still have initiative because you hit him last. So what do you want to do next? Oh, so he couldn't steal initiative this time, I see. No, he because he, he wasn't able to successfully parry. If he had parried you successfully, 
then he might have initiative and be able to thrust at you. But you, you're basically keeping him on the back foot the entire time as you keep thrusting at him. All right, so I'll thrust at his right arm this time. All right, his upper arm or his lower arm? Oh, upper. Upper arm. Thrust at the right upper arm with how many dice? Ten. All ten. He's going to try to parry with his one. No successes. And you get one, two, three, four... Five, six, seven successes. Seven. I was counting two when I was muted. <laughs> All right. So, seven successes plus two for the strength bonus is a total damage of nine minus four for his toughness means that you have dealt a level five wound. So, level five wounds are the maximum wound level in this. So, oh, and you need to roll another 1d10, four for his upper arm. Yeah, you hit him right in the, the humerus area, the upper arm. And do do do. A piercing level five wound to the upper arm is five stun, 15 pain, 15 bleed. And he will have to get someone to make a surgery check versus a crippled limb. Otherwise, he will have the crippled limb bane for his right arm for the rest of his life. The bone is shattered, there's a clipped artery, he's unlikely to ever recover, and there's extreme bleeding as you have pierced through this guy's upper arm. He drops his weapon, falls to the ground, clutching at his arm, trying to stem the bleeding, and you've won the fight. All right. Yeah. So that's how, that's how fighting works in this game. Um, there's other pieces that go into it as you get more complicated. So, for instance, one of the things, um, like I said, you you didn't have to use it um, except one time, but that guarded strike that you did was uh, one of the advanced maneuvers, and it lets you kind of change up the fight. So another thing is the master strike. The master strike allows you to basically parry and strike all in one motion. Um, so it's really pretty deadly if somebody has, for instance, allocated all of their dice to an attack, and then you parry and strike in one motion, you parry their attack and then hit them, and they're just, you know, unable to do anything as you get a free hit in. All right. No armor is going to make it even more deadly and fast, I would think. No armor. That's that's part of why I wanted to play in a low armor situation. Um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool stuff in this system, including there's a whole thing for basically grappling with armor and having a dagger and the kind of realistic. So realistically a knight in like full plate armor the way you take them down is that you like trip them and then you punch through the the visor or the the chest plate or something like that with a dagger you don't like kill them with a sword like normal um and normal. this game represents <laughs> represents that really well um the problem is that that's a lot of uh more complicated kind of stuff and i i kind of like the low armor you have to parry every blow style feel um partly because obviously with like the way that uh D&D &D works uh low armor works out a little differently in D&D &D where you have armor class and you don't have the the kind of parry ability that a system like this allows for yeah for sure all right, so that's that's what I got um, for this session, and I know you've got stuff to do, so shall I do the outro? All right. Sure. Um, assuming that I have put this up on YouTube and you are watching this on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed our sort of foray into the Song of Swords system. I know there's not a whole lot of content about this system online, um, and so maybe it'll inspire you to try it out yourself. 
Um, yeah, if you liked the video, like it. If you want to leave a comment, that would be great too. And if you want to subscribe, that would be cool. Hobbs also has... Hmm? I was saying bunch. subscribe here, hit the bell over here. Yeah, all of that sort of stuff. Hobbs also, if you don't know, has a whole bunch of stuff that he does, including a great podcast, Hobbs and Friends, and another great podcast, Random Screed, and another great podcast, Hex Talk. Um, and he has a YouTube channel where he puts up his uh, uh, Kalmata games and Lost in Agata games and all of that sort of stuff. So you should go... Check that out if you have stumbled onto my channel and don't know about Jason Hobbs, then you could uh, do all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's everything. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you.